Okay, welcome back. I hope that you're all enjoying the lunch. There's plenty of food. We planned for a lot of people, and there's not a ton of people, so please eat like second and thirds. Um, we have the room reserved until 1.15, but we'll be recording until 1.30, so we'll see what happens. Um, so this is our second panel. Um, it, it is the final part of our symposium for today. Uh, they'll be responding to both the first panel and Professor Meyer's keynote topic, um, but it'll be focusing on human rights in global health governance, um, including what tactics lawyers and policymakers can use to further human rights. Um, our moderator for this panel is Professor Barack Richmond from here at Duke Law, uh, where among other things he teaches courses on health law and policy. And with a PhD in economics, he sees healthcare policy through a law and economics lens, providing a very helpful and perhaps unique perspective on the issue. Um, he's written and spoke if, spoken extensively on healthcare policy, and including recently to the House of Representatives on the Affordable Care Act. Um, and although he's not currently teaching this semester here, he graciously returned to moderate our panel. Um, and he was the first professor that we went to for advice about the symposium. Um, and he was really instrumental in putting this all together. So thank you, and I'll let you take it from here. No, thanks. Actually, of all the accolades, it's that last one that I'll, I'll that, that is, most, is most gratifying right now. Um, and even so, I'm, I don't, I'm still assuming too much credit in actually being anything more than just the person who introduced two and Danny to each other who really did everything. Um, so. Uh, Without any further ado, uh, I, I, I'm, I'll just say that it's terrific this conference is happening. There's enormous need to have these sorts of conversations in the university. It's especially terrific to have a conversation like this sponsored by a, a specific collaboration um, between the School of Global Health uh, and the law school. Uh, and as Mike introduced his panel, uh, I'll echo what he said, which is that I really hope that these conversations continue and are further institutionalized uh, and can inform the rest of what the university does. Um, I will briefly introduce our panelists, uh, do it so briefly only so we can leave more time for discussion. Um, I will first uh, call upon Ben Meyer, who, as you saw from the keynote, is a professor at the UNC School of Public Health. Uh, I will then call upon Professor Michelle Borzelay, who's a senior scholar with the O'Neill Institute, um, the O'Neill Institute for National and Global Health Law at the University of Georgetown. Uh, and then I'll call upon Professor Bob Cook Deegan. I have, I believe, an outdated bio for Bob. Bob has been Duke for many years, and I believe we're tragically losing him to uh, Arizona State University. But he's been uh, part of the, the still here, still at Duke, um, still summer. and has been part of uh, a really instrumental leader in the conversation we've had on health law and science and policy at Duke, and has been one of the people um, who really embodies the interdisciplinary need and spirit that we both have at Duke and hope to grow at Duke. Um, so I thought I would begin uh, just by asking Ben to recap uh, his talk this morning uh, as a way of uh, sparking further conversation. So if, and I'll maybe I'll ask you to focus more on the take home messages. Tell us in three minutes or less what the take home lessons are uh, from your research and from your talk. And, and so as quickly as possible to save time for the people who haven't yet gotten the chance to speak, I'll, I'll really draw on what you just said and, and make the argument that we need more interdisciplinary research at the intersection of global health and international human rights law. We have not done this in the past. It requires bringing together methods from international law, political science, public policy, global health, all to help us develop means of accountability. We've developed these great treaties. They provide amazing sets of rights that can protect global health. They are implemented inconsistently. How can we create more consistent implementation given that we have no real enforcement for international human rights law in the world? In my presentation, I tried to draw together a number of different projects that focus on international treaty bodies through the United Nations, on national law reforms, on judicial activism, and on civil society. Trying to come up with a research agenda by which we can do the comparative research across nations to understand what public health has long known, that we need best practices. Public health has long thought about best practices for addressing our global health issues. In law, we never make normative judgments that one law is better than another law. 
how do we think about developing best practices in public health law, whether for Ebola, whether for human rights implementation, recognizing that we have this diverse array of laws that do very different things. And I hope that this interdisciplinary conversation can be the start of what I hope is a larger empirical research dialogue to develop comparative research across nations and understand best practices for real, realizing the highest attainable standard of health. Great, thanks. Um, so Michelle, you've actually been, had experiences both in helping craft a lot of these international agreements and also as a practicing attorney in seeing what the legal and practical consequences of those agreements have been. Mm -hmm. um, so you're, you're perfect to take up the mantle right now. What, what do you think about Ben's charge uh, about trying to translate these international agreements into practicalities on the ground? Okay. Well, I think that's one of the most impor important questions we need to answer, and um, it's where I spend most of my time as a practitioner, as what I call a global health lawyer. In fact, I really don't have a good full name for what I do, um, depending on where you find me working. Sometimes I'm called a technical advisor, sometimes I'm called a governance advisor, sometimes I'm called a legislative drafter, sometimes I'm called a professor. So I think that there's an emerging field for implementing law in the global health arena. And that for me translates for the most part into operationalizing or implementing law at the national level because that's where it has to work on a day-to-day -day basis. That's where the emergency happens. It's where the day-to-day -day health challenges arise and have to be met by the private and the public health sector. And so uh, I think I would add to Professor Meyer's four dimensions of accountability a fifth one. And the fifth one would be what I call health development law. And it's a field that I think we are starting to see happen in um, the world I inhabit uh, with the development donor work that I do and also increasingly directly for governments that hire me to come in and help revise national legislation, uh, help them to implement national legislation uh, and reform, I reform it. Uh, so for example, this month I'm heading off to uh, Swaziland and Turkey where I will be working with the governments to look across all of the laws relevant to the health sector and see how they actually work in day-to-day -day practice. And to do that, I have to work with the public health people. Uh, and it's not just what we would call traditional public health people, it's the managers and senior leadership of the government, the private sector folks that are involved in um, serving and working with the public sector, the Ministry of Finance, the Ministry of Trade, uh, the police, the military, uh, the airport folks, the, the guys that run the ports and the border crossings, customs, et cetera. And all of those people have to do their job every day. And so the work is to make sure that the law can be implemented, that it supports their health objectives and what they want to do. Um, I, I agree that there ought to be best practices for public health law. But for me, the best practice for public health law is to make sure the law is aligned with the health objectives of the country, that the way in which national law is uh, structured is in alignment with international obligations, such as IHR or any other international agreement that the country may have ratified. And then also to make sure that the functions and the performance of the government agencies involved is aligned with the law. So uh, that's where I spend my time and where, where I also think you can get uh, big advances in accountability to meet human rights objectives. Because in the end of the day, if I can't go to the doctor and get treated, then how is my right to health being you know, enforced? So I'll leave it there for the moment and look for more questions. Terrific. Mm -hmm. um, uh, Bob, y y your, your involvement in, in, the, in the intersection of these conversations mostly happened in the pharmaceutical area. Um, and you've seen a lot of I guess you've seen a lot of pharma input into these international agreements, and it sounds, well, what have you observed? <laughs> so I wanted, I wanted to, let me step one step back from that, if you, if you don't mind, Barack. One of the things, uh, I've, this intersection of, of human rights and health, 
has a, a long history, and we saw some of the landmarks in that. And it's actually kind of a miraculous thing, if you think about it, what happened in 1948, codifying what we think we all believe universally across cultures and all that. It's, an, it's actually a monumental intellectual achievement. Um, but most of the emphasis in, in human rights when I was early in my career and when, when I was in medical school and when I first went to Washington was really focused on using the tools of empiricism that you learn in medicine and in science and applying those to the bad things that were happening all over the world, like people getting tortured or chemical weapons being dropped on the Kurds in Iraq. Um, so that was my early experience of health and human rights. What I think is beginning to happen now is we're paying more attention to other aspects of human rights, like access to the goods and services that are needed to provide medical care. So access to essential medicines, vaccines, devices, et cetera. And also thinking of human rights, uh, health as one of the human rights that is interacting in a really, really complicated ecosystem of other things. So we've talked about border guards, we've talked about transportation systems, we've talked about the telecom system that was really important in Nigeria. These are, there are bodies of law about all that stuff that intersect with who lives and who dies. Um, and yet we haven't intellectually moved up to that level. So I think that's what's beginning to happen. I wanted to then shift gears and I will talk now about development of, uh, and I'm gonna focus on what's the role of law in the process of developing new things that we can do to improve health. So this is innovation. What kind of innovation do we want? What kind does our system as we have now designed it provide? And I love the framework that Ben laid out, which is international treaties, national laws, civil action societies, and legal challenges, judicial challenges. But I wanted to shift gears to a different area. And I'm gonna take one little sliver of things that are happening a lot, really fast, looking at the part of the world that I look at the most, which is this little tiny sliver of the world that is called genomics, and is developing new technologies based on one miraculous technology, which is the ability to derive DNA sequence, the order of base pairs in our DNA within our bodies, by making copies of molecules and then figuring out what the sequence and the order of the base pairs. Why do we care about that? Well, because DNA is the storage and transmission medium for biological information. It's the instruction set, although the, all these metaphors are completely misleading if you push them to the edge. But the thing is, it's a really important molecule and it contains information. And most of the times when we're manipulating DNA, we're manipulating because we want to we either want information out of it, like a diagnosis, what is the sequence of DNA in that person's body, or we want to use DNA as the way to produce something valuable, like let's use DNA as the way to produce insulin, because we don't want to be killing lots and lots of pigs and, and purifying insulin from their pancreases, which was the way we used to make insulin. So DNA is at the center of a lot of this stuff. So let me just give you an example. And I'm going to seg from one example to two other domains of policy that, have, that, have, that are underway right now. Um, one is, under this same framework, in intellectual property world, we have the TRIPS agreement that basically is an international treaty that says all the countries that have signed this have to change their nas national laws to comport with a worldwide standard of the protection of intellectual property. Um, and. Um, under those obligations, uh, national laws have been changed, including U.S. law, at least twice so far. We've changed U.S. law to bring it into compliance with international norms. Um, at the same time, in our little area of genomics, it's really interesting because legal challenges became a strategy for changing the law. And what happened in 2009 was the Myriad case that that's, I know some of you, uh, I've lectured to the, to, uh, the, the freshman class here at Duke about the, the, this incredibly interesting case. The origin of that was not, it, it's a patent case. It's about the, the question at the end that the Supreme Court considered was, are human genes patentable? Really interesting for, forward question. Who brought that case? That was the American Civil Liberties Union. It was not Pfizer suing Merck or Amgen suing Genentech. It was a civil action group saying, we don't like the way the law is and we're gonna use the legal tools that are available to us. And the lead lawyer was a constitutional scholar. 
and litigator, mainly litigator. Um, so interesting. Um, so what happened out of that? Well, they've shaken the foundations. The, the Myriad case, the Mayo case have shaken the foundations. And what is so interesting is it's become obvious that within the domain of law, there's a lot of confusion and incoherence. News, <laughs> law students, law is not completely coherent. It changes and it depends on where you're sitting, how you interpret it. So in the United States and now in Australia, as of a couple weeks ago, you can't patent a gene that has, you can't patent a piece of DNA that corresponds to a sequence that would be found in nature. We think that's, we think that's true. We're not actually sure what that means, but we think that's true in the United States. But you can patent a piece of DNA if you've engineered and changed it so that it's markedly different from one that would be found in nature. That's what we think the law is in the US. In, in Australia, they're even more confused because their court, their high court, their Supreme Court went beyond where the US Supreme Court went. Um, so what do we have? We have a domain of law that collided with other values like access to health care and who gets to decide what the standards are for delivering a diagnostic technology into the world. And when it got to the level of the generalist courts, the Supreme Court and the High Court in Australia, they looked down at the other courts that are used to handling patent cases, which are usually fights among companies about who gets to own and, and make money from a new technology. They looked out there and said, what are you guys doing? And a series of unanimous decisions, Mayo, Myriad, and Myriad in Australia were all completely completely unanimous decisions, the generalist judges are looking out and say, what you guys have been doing for the last 30 years makes no sense. You're allowing patents to be conferred on things that are not inventions. And we aren't going to let that happen. So the law is changing. There were lawyers involved on both sides of this. Um, but the, 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 the world of intellectual property law has not fully adjusted to this new world of what's patentable and what isn't. Let me give you an example of why that matters. So right now, what's the problem that we've got? DNA sequencing, the Human Genome Project, um, was about creating a reference sequence of the human genome to allow us to understand what's going on in human biology. It was a tool. What it inadvertently created was technologies that make it possible to sequence DNA incredibly cheaply. So I got my DNA, I got my sequence back last week. I haven't even had a chance to look at it, but I got my whole genome sequence at Illumina. And I'm going to a meeting next week that's about telling me what I found, what they found. That is six orders to seven orders of magnitude cheaper than it costs to produce the reference genome about 15 years after the reference genome was created. This is an extraordinary technological revolution. Lots and lots and lots of new information. What does that mean? It means that we're now able to, at an individual level, try to find out what's different between my genome and the average genome. That's information, and we're trying to make inferences about that. Now, how are we going to do that? The only way we're going to be able to do that is if everybody's sharing a lot of information about how each individual person's genome differs from the norm and follow those people over time and see what they were exposed to in the environment, what their parents did to them, and what drugs they took, and what health outcomes they have. That means sharing lots of information about the genomic variation and linking it to all sorts of other information. We need data sharing and stuff like that. What are we encountering in the real world? We're encountering national laws that say you cannot export genetic resources, data and samples, passed by places like Brazil, Russia, India, China, um, under a particular framework of this is how biotechnology is going to work, we want to do in our countries what the United States did to Europe, which is set up intellectual property laws that allow you to cheat at the margin so that your economy does better than theirs, relatively speaking, over time. So if I were to take a step back from that, that answer, which has an incredible number of delicious tidbits, <laughs> I'm hearing not only a great deg degree of variation in health law, but also a great degree of creativity in how health law is both implemented and also creativity, or you might say variation, in how the priorities of health law are articulated. Um, it's a perfect challenge. It's kind of a challenge that I'm, I've been, been chewing on throughout Ben's talk about really the, instrument, the, the implementability of any sort of what we call in law positive rights. So I understand that we can have an international convention against torture. I think I can also understand how we can have an international convention against chemical weapons. Uh, 
Given how, how varied health law priorities are, given how creative health lawyers are, and given, and this is perhaps the biggest less takeaway from Bob's comment, given how sensitive to technological innovations any sort of standard of care is, how do you think these, how do you think these treatises, these treaties that try to articulate some kind of positive right could really be administered? And I think what we're talking about is not how they could, but how they are being administered. And, and my argument is that we need to understand the various ways in which what were formerly called positive rights, and we now think of all human rights as being interconnected and interrelated, but the ways in which the wide range of rights are being employed, particularly around, and this was where a lot of the questions were before, which is about access to technologies. So as the highest attainable standard of health um, moves forward, and, and we would all agree, I hope, that human rights are not handed down from God on stone tablets, but they are evolving concepts that reflect the current state of affairs. As our technology changes, is there room for law to play a role in prioritizing these positive rights? And one of the interesting things that we've seen, both in courts of law and in national legislation, is the ways in which these positive rights, which we've all said are subject to a principle of progressive realization, that they are subject to the amount of money that is available in a country, the ways in which legal systems and creative lawyers have found ways to create enforceability notwithstanding this resource-dependent standard. So how can we think about national governments with limited budgets, technologies with sometimes high, high price tags, and the ways in which courts need to balance what is an obligation of government? How do we use limited resources to, to do all of these things that are necessary for health? And are, are courts the best place to do that? Well, so maybe, Michelle, that, that's where I'd love to have you weigh in, because it seems as though if, if, we're thinking about, if we're thinking about encouraging polities to maximize the use of their limited resources, which vary across nations, um, and their pri health priorities vary across nations, it would seem to me as though the use of a court and an individual plaintiff would really disrupt the ability to allocate resources effectively. I mean, you know, but the, I'm, I'm part of part of this is takes take it, it is brought out of Bob's larger comment about the world of intellectual property, where individual rights uh, and individual suits are the best way to foul up really sensible solutions. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Hmm. All right. There's a couple of pieces to the answer to that question. I think. First of all whether litigation serves a wider purpose than the individual plaintiff is sometimes dependent upon the nature of the case and the court uh, and the country you're in, the context that you're in. I've seen terrific cases coming out of the European Court of Justice which require the allocation of resources where none had been allocated in terrible ways, uh, where patients had to travel in the middle of the night to four or five hospitals before they could be received into care. And that's just unacceptable, in a, particularly in a developed country, never mind a developing country. And in those kinds of cases where there are actually some resources available, you can get pretty good results with shifting of resources as a result of a judicial decision. Judicial decisions can be blunt instruments, but they are not always uh, effective solutions to getting where we want to go. But the other point I want to make is that um, I think it's really important in these kinds of conversations to distinguish between developed countries and developing countries. And within developing countries, you have low-income countries and middle-income countries. And there are terrific differences between them. There are also big differences between urban and rural areas. And what does the right to health look like in those different environments? In an urban environment, the right to health looks like there's a, ter a tertiary hospital something probably associated with an academic institution where there's a higher skill level and competency level amongst the health professionals and that within the central ministry of health there's a higher skill set amongst the public health folks, the epidemiologists, the, the, the people that really do public health work as opposed to health care. And I think it's got to keep in mind that 
in the, the developing world and most countries outside the United States, when we talk about public health, we're not talking about traditional public health as we think of it here in the United States. We're thinking about publicly delivered health care services and traditional public health. So I distinguish the two when I speak by saying public health, and I mean traditional public health when I say that, versus health care, which might be delivered by the public system or by the private sector. And so what, what does the right to health look like? We, we've tried throughout history of public health to define it with comment 14, with the Alma-Ada Declaration, by putting it in the context of primary health care. And I, for one, you know, I have a degree in public health myself. And so I like to use the, the, the guidelines, the, the standards of what we've learned in public health through all kinds of clinical trials and, and learning knowledge about what it means to deliver adequate care to people and to handle a public health situation or do public health work. And so if we take those kinds of, that kind of know-how, that kind of experience, such as what, why is primary health care so important uh, to the entire population? Why is reproductive health care important? Why is um, making sure that women get um, care prior, while they're pregnant and just after they're delivering? Why is that timeline so important to the, to the lifespan of an individual? And if we focus our looking at the right to health in the context of urban and rural, developed versus undeveloped country, and within the context of the, what we know about health care, I think we do a much better job in defining what the right to health looks like. And unfortunately, you go into a court system in, in any country here in the United States or in a developed country, you don't get judges necessarily who have a, an understanding of this. You don't even get necessarily an attorney general who's arguing the case before the court, who's fighting the case, to, who, who's able to articulate what this looks like in a very real way to the judge. So how is the judge going to make a good decision? I'm pleased by the decision Bob talks about because I happen to believe that's the right health decision. And in law as well, I think it's a correct decision. So when we can marry law and public health together, we get the best solution as far as I'm concerned. And the other thing is that we have all these international declarations. They are to a large extent the least common denominator of what the law can say at the international level. Um, uh, Professor Merson, Dr. Merson has been in the World Health Assembly as I've sat in the Health Assembly as a delegate and in all kinds of other forums where a lot of people are trying to come to a consensus statement, uh, a, a resolution on the floor of the Assembly, or, or the two bodies of law that came out of the World Health Assembly the International Health Regulations and the Framework Convention on Tobacco Control are the two pieces of law we have technically that are public health law. And they are, to a large extent, watered down versions of, of taking the best we know about science and putting it into a legal measure. Because we had to get somewhere, we had to get somewhere, and we got somewhere with both of those pieces of law. It's not perfect by any stretch of the imagination, and certainly the international health regulations which give permission to countries to block trade, block the movement of people and, and cargo, um, you know, we saw a lot of problems with the Ebola crisis. And we're going to continue to see problems because we're not a perfect world. And law is not perfect either. But at least it's general enough. And if we're good about what we do by marrying public health with law, we get at least the best we can do at that point in time with coming up with a legal statement, a provision in the law, that moves us forward down this line. If you look at the Tobacco Framework and Convention Control, uh, Framework Convention on Tobacco Control, I always get that wrong. It was in, in the 50s that the British uh, scientists came out with the information upon the relationship between smoking and cancer. Okay, the science was pretty clear, but yet it took until, when was the Framework Convention? It was in 2002? 2003. That's 53 years it took to move from science to law, and we're still in the process of implementing the tobacco convention around the world. Even in the United States, we still have trouble, trouble implementing it. So what does Tanzania do? What does Sudan do? Uh, the IHR were a compilation of rules that came out of the sanitary convention 
um, when ice was being moved north and south between the United States and the Caribbean, and malaria was coming with it uh, and back and forth with cargo. So now we have the latest version of the IHR, and they were passed in 2005, 10 years ago. Yet some 60% of countries around the world haven't yet fully implemented them. It's a lot of work. It's a lot of work. And time-consuming work, it's not funded well by donors. Countries themselves are struggling to manage their resources in terms of human personnel and financial resources in order to do the day-to-day -day delivery of healthcare services and do their public health work. Uh, and and yet implement these international conventions and take into consideration the best practices we have. It's a lot of work. And I don't think that ministries of health are well equipped academically or otherwise. I've often believed that people who work in ministries of health need a special class on how to know everything in the world and then do your job. They, they need to know about law, they need to know about finance, they need to about, know about health insurance, they need to, about, need to know about emergency preparedness, they need to know about organizational management and development, they need to know about human resources, they need to know about what to do with the multitude of donors that are in their pocket all day long, making them answer 27 different reports on what they're doing with HIV AIDS, and those donors don't talk to each other, those donors don't help them have a single reporting mechanism, um, they have whole offices that are set up just to deal with donors. What kind of use of resources is that? So I think they do the best they can, and there's lots more that we all can do as the public health and law community to, to advance this conversation along the way. Um, and I'm glad we're having this conversation today because I think it's a very important one uh, to have. So, so I and by the, so I guess we have to we have until 1:30. Is that right? Okay, great. So let me ask one last question to Bob. Bob, I'll limit your answer to two minutes, and then we'll take questions. Um, I, I heard Michelle's answer. I, I heard the substance of Michelle's response to, to mean two things. Um, one is there is enormous value in basic research from public health, um, and they have translated to enormous improvements at a relatively low cost in the quality of life. Uh, uh, primary care, prenatal care, immunizations, I'll add to that, the development of sewers. Um, these were all remarkable uh, discoveries from basic public, uh, basic public health research translated into policy. Usually not policies by lawyers and by the courts, uh, but by policy by municipalities and the like. The other part of Michelle's answer, where I, I, I think I might have heard something she didn't intend to say, um, <laughs> is that the Translating these discoveries, these basic, really important scientific discoveries into legal foundations, not just policies, but legal foundations, it takes enormous work. And I wonder not only if there are, if there are important reasons to why it takes so much work, but actually it might be suggestions that it's not worth the effort. Um, we think about, no, no, I know that's not what you meant to say. I know that's not what, you, not what you meant to say. Um, um, if, we, if we understand the court uh, as the availability of uh, any party out there to bring any legal claim they want, you yourself brought, said, said it was quite unusual in the Myriad case that you had a public interest litigator, and usually, especially before you get to the Supreme Court, you have private litigators who have deeply private interests they're very well stocked, and the sources of legal disputes they have are not ones that involve public health, but usually very private interests. So right. I ask you in two minutes, um, is there something institutionally about the courts uh, and about the li litigation system that really is at tension with implementing the values of, of public health? Yes, sometimes, and, and yet at the same time it's often a tool. So, so you asked a question about this human right, right? So we have a bunch of aspirational documents that say we do have a right to health. And that's pretty widely shared and it's, it's close to universal and we all agree on the end goal. This is the usual situation in politics, right? We, end on, we, we agree on something very vague and, you know, pursuit of happiness and life liberty, right? So we get that part. And how do we get there is where we disagree, right? So one of the problems with healthcare is it's like education and housing. It's one of those rights that if you really mean it, you have to fulfill it. And what we've done through these international documents and say, you government are the one who, you're the ones who are responsible for making sure that we do that through either direct means or indirect means. Um, so are the courts a good way to do that? Well, sometimes the courts are a good way to do it. If the pharmaceutical industry is stupid enough to sue 
South Africa because they have a particular framework that they want to keep keep on that track and they haven't read the South African Constitution carefully enough, they're going to lose and the rules change and they did change in South Africa, right? It, it, it fundamentally, when they lost, it mattered. Um, so also the myriad example I gave. So those are examples of the courts wrestling with, okay, so you've got certain bodies of law like intellectual property law you know what, that doesn't trump all these other bodies of law. There are other things that we care about as generalist judges, and when it collides with the rights of a patent holder, we may not go with the patent holder. Um, so that's interesting, and so the law is, is a tool for effecting and actually implementing this idea of a right, but actually most of the work, most of the work, that's the outlier case, most of the work is going to be in trying to define what things we're going to do in order to fulfill those rights. That gets down to how much health care do you deserve? Do we spend it on health care? Do we spend it on sewers? Do we spend it on transportation systems that allow us to, to maintain our, a good food supply and things like that? Um, it's those questions about, in, in the U.S. context, that means a lot of the work is going to be done by decide, deciding what we mean by reasonable and medically necessary under Medicare and Medicaid because all the private payers follow the federal lead. That's where most of the decisions are going to be made. And are there lawyers involved in doing that? Yeah, for sure. Um, and what products are we going to allow on the market through the FDA? There are huge bodies of law that require legal expertise, and that's how we actually fulfill these rights. Great. Um, let me open it up then. <coughs> Why don't we start in the back there? Uh, yeah, sure. So kind of in this research, and once you identify the best practices and uh, public health law, how do you get nations on board to kind of adopt that pr particular practice or how do you engage them and kind of bring them and bring them into the fold to kind of follow suit with that? Michelle, Ben, what would you do? Sure. Um, I'll start in the context of human rights. I mean, we began by saying that there is no global court that can focus on these issues. There is no global police. The tool we have and it's the tool we use most frequently and all of the accountability mechanisms is based upon is shame. Naming countries that are falling behind and shaming them into compliance. This is how the international health regulations work with WHO. This is how human rights works. If you don't have the ability to shame a country, how can you get them to behave? And you can shame them either domestically, if there's a robust civil society that can put pressure on the government, or you can shame them internationally if there's enough of an international voice that can press the country to make changes. So when I was talking, I was talking about civil society, I was talking about litigation, I was talking about policy reforms, and I was talking about the UN's role. I don't think that any one of them is particularly necessary and sufficient, but I think all of them together make up a, a somewhat redundant, if overlapping and complementary set of accountability mechanisms that are necessary, no matter what we're talking about, in order to translate our international goals into national progress. Actually, you know, let me, Michelle, if you could hold on this, I want to see if I can get some more questions also, instead of um, sure. more, more responses. Yeah, um, actually, Susan, you had a question, right? Try to make sure that people who have who have who have asked questions in previous panels, with all due respect, get lower on the line. <laughs> I have two questions. Okay. You have two questions. <laughs> you right. can answer them later. We can talk about. It, but okay. I'm still going to ask. Um, so my first question is for Michelle. Um, she had talked about global health security law project. I would love to know more about that. Um, my next question is uh, to everybody on the panel, and that is, so, you know, obviously Ben just now talked about how there's no global police, everything is about naming and shaming when it comes to international health regulations. However, you have, uh, you have other laws like TRIPS Agreement, um, which was signed by similar, like it was signed by the WTO, um, you know, there the compliance is ensured, I mean, I'm not a lawyer, but from what I've read is the compliance is ensured pretty strictly. So. Why not have something similar to in, ensure that the international health regulations is complied by the international states? And also the role donors can play. With human rights, we often see a lot of donors actually um, in, say, you know, human rights is not being followed. We're going to stop giving aid. You know, the role of donors in uh, ensuring compliance of international health regulations, I would really like your thoughts on that. 
Right. And you're talking about non, you might say non-legal interventions. You mean non non litigation? Oh, okay. Um, well, I'm going to go back to the question of how do we get um, countries to comply. This gentleman in the back, his question, and roll it into um, your questions. I think donors have a very important role to play in making sure that the international frameworks that we do have available to us are instituted. I think donors are behind the curve when it comes to bringing the law to bear on the work that they do in health development. But I think, I'm hoping, that the global health security agenda in all of its dimensions, not just the legal aspects of it, will help push that conversation forward because there is a now a strong relationship between the World Health Organization, the World Bank, and the European Union in the work of the global health security agenda. Plus. A lot of other countries are involved in it and have put money behind it. Um, and because the Global Health Security Agenda crosses IHR, it also crosses the World Animal Health Organization, known as OIE in the French uh, version of the word, uh, and also the Food and Agriculture Organization, um, and their frameworks for surveillance, reporting, and legal structures that, that I have some hope that there'll be money that focuses on this work and that it is integrated into the other development work that the World Bank does the US, and that USAID, the European Union, and the British government, and others that do development work do because it's part of health system strengthening and unless we bring it in there, I don't know where else it goes. Um, so uh, there's a difference between the way in which uh, countries comply with the World Trade Organization legal framework versus the World Health Organization system. The World Trade Organization is a system whereby if you want to join it, you have to apply for membership effectively. And in order to be accepted into membership, you have to upgrade, modernize, change your national laws and systems in order to be in compliance with the trade agreements, TRIPS being just one of them. Another has to do with sanitary and phytosanitary standards, and another has to do with technical barriers to trade, which have great implications for health. So um, there, if you want to play by the rules, you got to work by the rules, as opposed to the World Health Organization, whose membership is every member of the United Nations. So you automatically become a member of the WHO when you're in the UN. And the WHO has two constitutional provisions that talk about how you pass a law, a treaty, or a regulation. The Framework Convention on Tobacco Control was done as a treaty under one provision of the Constitution where countries had to ratify it at national level, whereas the international health regulations come in under another provision that says you opt out, otherwise you're in. So it has a different mechanism by which it's applicable. That doesn't mean that in any of those cases that you still don't have to implement it into national law because here's this body of law and, it, and you still have to look and see, do I have that provision in my national law? Do I have that provision and if not, I have to add it? Or is this provision in the IHR in conflict with what I have locally? You have to fix it, you have to clean it up. And that's a bit of work. Um, the Global Health Security Agenda Law Project looks across the 11 Global Health Security Action Packages and Ben had them up on the board, so I don't have to repeat them, I hope. <laughs> I can just about do them off the top of my head. And what we've done in the last several months is to analyze all of the action packages to understand what legal domains are implicated by the various action packages and to try and draft and design what would be an optimum package of laws that would be in place at the country level in order for a country to um, achieve the action package targets. And the last comment I want to make is that there's a difference between national legislation or an international treaty, which is typically more general language and shorter language. But the details of how those laws are implemented are often done in a regulation. We have them here in the United States under the Code of Federal, Re Fed Code of Federal Regulations, and all countries have ministerial regulations and standards and guidelines. And it's in those pieces of legal instruments that you sometimes find more of the details about how things are done. 
and um, are very important to really do the definition we need in order to see the right to health realized. It's not necessarily in the national legislation or in the international piece of law. Yes, those give us good directions and often uh, mandates, but the details, you know, the devil's in the details always, typically will come in subnational instruments uh, that are very effective in shaping how things are done. And I use them quite a bit in my work because we don't have to go to parliament. We don't have to get involved in the political process. We can do an awful lot, assuming there is sufficient legal authority in the national legislation to do what the ministry wants to do. Terrific. Um, I'm going to take some more questions. Um, yes, go ahead. So I have a brief follow-up to Solson's question, which was on, I think she wanted to address also like the underlying weaknesses or differences between institutionals, between institutions like WHO, WIPO in the past, but now the WTO. But now, how? what do you think about the new challenges that treaties such as the Trans-Pacific Partnership and the negotiations of the Transatlantic transatlantic partnership and investment agreements and this new wave of, of bilateral and FTAs are posing for global health and human rights and IP among other th things. So Ben, why don't you take this and as an incentive, if you're brief, we can squeeze in one more question after your answer. Oh. <laughs> why don't we take huh? question? Let's take the other question. Oh, okay. ah. So I, I can follow up because this, this relates to the previous question. I, I think when I said that there's an enforcement problem uh, at the intersection of global health and human rights, I meant that largely in the context of WHO's treaties and human rights treaties. Um, trade law is a different animal altogether. Why is the TRIPS agreement the trade-related aspects of intellectual property rights? Is it because there's something inherently trade-related about intellectual property? No. Um, it's a fiction, all to get into the WTO, because the WTO, rather than WIPO, the World Intellectual Property Organization, WTO has a binding enforcement body. It has what we would love to have in human rights, what WHO would love to have for its international health regulations, a set of agreements that specify the terms under which enforcement will be undertaken and the penalties for non-enforcement. Ah, it would be lovely if such a world exists, I think, we need political scientists who are willing to sit down and ask how these kinds of things have developed in the WTO and how they can be employed in other areas, moving into the TPP and the transatlantic treaties. Um, we need to understand what those enforcement mechanisms mean and how the enforcement mechanisms can in some ways put international treaties in conflict with one another. What happens when a provision of the TPP with a binding enforcement provision conflicts with the international human right to health, which does not. This, I think, will be a challenging legal question going forward. All right. Uh, we have time for one more question. Let's do one more question. We only have a recidivist. Oh, you, you, have, yeah, you had a question, right? Yeah. yeah Go ahead. Um, yeah. Uh, I guess uh, we've discussed the language of the right to health. Uh, I think the... Um, um, the 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 issues in sub-Saharan Africa, in particular, with 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 access to medicines, um, I think the language of the right to life would have been uh, a more effective, and more narrow, and more straight to the point way of expressing what they were fighting for, because in the con in that context, it wasn't an overarching right to health trying to create a a system in place that that backs it up on all levels, but it was the medicines here, uh, it could be had at this price, and these barriers are preventing it, and then therefore preventing our right to life, so to speak. Um, and I was just curious why this term hasn't um, come up, because I think when you say right to life, it clearly jumps up on the priorities of where right to health might conflict with other rights present uh, in the discourse. Right to health, right to life, right to medicine, right to doctors? I, I would say that's true, but nobody does it for that very reason. Because when you talk about the right to life, you're talking about something that isn't bound by the principle of progressive realization. 
So whenever courts have considered these issues, particularly on access to medicines, they've always considered them under the right to health because these are resource dependent obligations for countries. So the right to life, I agree from a philosophical perspective, it makes more sense. But this is what we need empirical research for, which is to tell us that what makes the most sense philosophically isn't actually played out in practice, where the right to health is really becoming um, the litigation strategy or the claim that is made. Michelle, Bob, any final sh uh, parting, parting shots? Well, yeah, <laughs> a, a comment on the right to life. Um, so you're coming down from Maryland, um, where right to life means something different than it does in North Carolina. Um, yeah. In the U.S. context, the right to life language is probably actually weaker than a right to health. Um, mm -hmm. And that's because of the political history of the abortion debate and, and all the things that have been clustered around this right to life, um, let alone, although, you know, it's in the Declaration of Independence. Um, I don't think it made it into the Constitution, did it? <laughs> no. So it's, it's, I, I think a lot of the, uh, just kind of one general it's theme. Fourteenth Amendment, actually. Yeah. Without due process of law. Okay. Sorry. So, but I, I actually think these yeah. things are highly cultural, culturally dependent. But one one observation that's that I find really really interesting, and I'm one of these people who's studying. I'm, I'm a I'm a border figure. I'm talking to people in different domains, and all of them are quite like rightly aware of my limitations of my knowledge <laughs> and point that out to me repeatedly. <laughs> um, but. One of the observations that I think is there's a there's a wave that's beginning to break, and it is going to probably break over drug pricing and drug innovation. I think that's the hot topic where a lot of these questions about access and all that are going to be played out, and the rules that we begin to deploy for solving this problem of very high drug prices um, is going to spill over into other domains of health policy. And I have no idea what's going to happen there except to observe one political factor, which is there are two groups of people who live in bubbles who are beginning to collide at the margins. And when bubbles come together, they begin to do really, really interesting things. One bubble is the folks who think about the 1980s, 1990s as the way the world is, which is vertically integrated pharmaceutical companies that have lots of money, high profit margins, and high IP. And that's the world that they've grown up in. And they believe fervently that's the only way to do innovation. And for a two decade period, that was a, a first approximation of how it worked. And then another group of people who find that incredibly corrupt and distrust the entire system that depends on the rights and interests of large corporations, especially when they're in conflict with public health. And those two groups are coming together over this issue of access to medicines in a really, really big way. And I think there's going to be a lot of fireworks coming out of that little domain. Great. Michelle, last words? You don't have to. No, I, I, I was just going to say personally, I sure hope we bust the bubble of the pricing of medicines in the United States because to a large extent the profit margins in the United States pay for drugs in the rest of the world. So, um, you know, I, I'm one of those people that when I'm in Switzerland or France or Germany or in some other countries, I buy medicines for myself because they're cheaper than here and, and not just a little bit cheaper, a lot cheaper. So you have to ask yourself, what are the Europeans doing that we're not? What are the Canadians doing that we're not in the United States? Why is it that drugs are the most costly in the United States than anywhere else on the planet? That's a, that, that's, a, that's a great closing part because what I was going to say mm -hmm. is that global health begins at home. Yes. I think that there are enormous lessons uh, from today's conversation that we can apply not just in Liberia and Sierra Leone, but also in Durham, North Carolina. Um, and I'm delighted uh, to end on that note, in part because, again, it's another opportunity to thank the kind of collaborations that we've had. So I have a special thanks for Danny and for Tu for organizing this. Uh, very thanks for the students who have come, and I hope the students with the law school and the DHI can continue to talk to each other. Yes. Thank you. Whoever your point of contact is for links, uh, or we're going to post it on our Facebook group. And don't forget to come to Satisfaction at 6 p.m. If you have more questions, that'll be your opportunity. Um, and there are free rates. So. Whoa, okay. <laughs> <laughs> Public health hazard. I know. Right, right, right. Hey, well done. Oh, sorry. Oh, this is actually really nice.